Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of endless travel possibilities. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Neeling. Uh, we got a lot, to, a lot to talk about today, right, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Where do we start? Um, well, what's this episode going to be? Let's start there. Well, we have a very special guest that we're going to interview in a moment. I think we have some announcements first, right? Yes. So this will be the last episode of season two for us, but more to come before long. Yeah, we just need some time to finish planning our trip to Japan and then go to Japan and then record some stuff about our trip to Japan. We're going to do a planning episode too, talk about how we planned the trip. Yeah, putting together our itinerary. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff coming up. There's just going to be a little gap in between. And uh, so you can watch Instagram, you can watch Twitter, you can watch the podcast feed for announcements on when that new season is coming. Absolutely. Yeah, we're definitely going to be posting content while we're in Japan. Definitely. See some of the cool stuff as we're seeing it. There are going to be pictures. There are going to be videos. You know, Paul, did you notice that Instagram has like abandoned photos and it's all videos now? Yes. So I guess we're going to need to make some videos when we're at all these beautiful places in Japan. Yeah, there's that meme now where it's a video, but it's just a picture and there's like a voiceover going, aha, this is just a picture, but it's real. Yeah. It's a seven second long picture. You know, trying to get the algorithm's attention. Yeah. Uh, we might even do an Instagram Live at some point. Sure. <laughs> might be able to twist Jason's arm into that one. So another announcement is that while we are in Japan, we're going to be having a podcast meetup event in Tokyo on April 5th. We're going to be at Hitachi no Brewing Lab in Akihabara at 7 p.m. I'm looking forward to it. Definitely. No RSVP required. We're just going to be there. Feel free to show up and say hello. Yeah, should be awesome. Jason, I also want to say thank you to the people who have bought the JR Pass through our affiliate link. Yeah, we appreciate that very much. Some people have done that now, so thank you so much. Again, it's the same cost for all of you, but we get a little kickback for driving the traffic their way. Yeah, great way to support the podcast. All right, well, I'm excited for this. It's time for the interview. So I first became aware of our guest as the host of the Japan Experts podcast, but she is also the creator of a Japan travel course. She is also a licensed guide in Japan. She is also just a very nice and knowledgeable person. So I would like to welcome to the podcast Miyuki Seguchi. Thank you, Miyuki, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be on your show. It's a pleasure to have you. Do you want to start out just telling us a bit about who you are, what your background is, and kind of what you do? Yes, um, thank you for asking me. So I was born in Japan and raised in a totally monolingual environment before moving to the UK at the age of 18. So after moving to the UK, I have gained immersive travel experiences in a few dozen countries and have worked in an international environment, first as a journalist and later as an in-house communicator. And after that, I started to work independently, helping companies with PR and communications projects. And I also studied and became a licensed guide and launched the Japan Experts podcast in the summer of 2020. And my current mission is to help fellow international travelers to create their unique Japan travel experience. And I'm about to launch a 30-day Japan travel program for that. Awesome. Well, would you care to elaborate a little bit on the 30-day program you've got? What is that? And how do you go about doing that with people? Sure. So the, my program, the Japan Travel Essential, is to basically to help people gain a good understanding of Japan before planning and traveling. So it's a Saturday program that gives the, all the essentials about Japan to determine where and where to visit, how to get around and where to stay. And it also includes a self-guided tour bundle about Japan's great sites. So that will be created based on my learning uh, from local guides that I travel with who are specialized in different culturally and historically important sites all across Japan. 
And that should cover where exactly to visit and what to look out for at each place and other interesting facts and recommendations about local places and the region.、Um, cool. And I'm also offering some. Japanese conversation starter kit as part of the program, too. So it's basically everything included in this package for international travelers who are planning to visit Japan. Very cool. Yeah, that's、so、really cool. I've listened to several episodes of your podcast, and there's a lot of good information there about travel basics of how to get around Japan, where to stay, what types of accommodation are available. So if someone were to Do this 30 day travel course, what kind of things would they get from that that they wouldn't get other places, like from the podcast or something like that? Yes. So basically, I'm aiming this program with people in mind who are eager to have、uh, authentic experiences and creating their unique Japan travel experiences. And one of the Things that I aim to highlight is that the program is for the introverted travelers. And that's because I'm a big introvert. And I think there are a lot of characteristics about being an introvert. And some of the things that are often said are the introverted people are more sensitive to what's around them. And so they need some time alone to re energize themselves. Or there are some social introverts too, but generally speaking, introverts are more comfortable with having a one on one conversation rather than a big group discussion. And they like to observe or research first and think a lot before they speak and ask deep questions. And I feel Japan is a great place to visit for introverted people, but they have a specific needs and special interests、um, because of who they are. And what I would like to、um, provide is to help support their travel planning and、uh, creating, like maximizing their travel experiences. So, for example, some introverted people like me may get tired easily when walking around a busy places. But Japan is not only about big cities, but also rural areas and the countryside too. And these places are a great choice for introverted people because they can pay close attention to small details of the natural landscapes and the regional differences, which are the things I'd like more people to experience when they visit Japan. But the countryside and rural areas are great, but International travelers may face some challenges in regards to the language and the cultural barriers. And introverted people、uh, would like to do a bit of preparation. So, knowing what to expect, how to best deal with possible situations they may come across should help. And so, I like to provide this kind of knowledge as well. And also, even in cities like Kyoto, there are a lot of lesser known places that are worth a visit. So, Kyoto is a very popular destination, and the overcrowding is becoming an issue for some of the areas in Kyoto. But if you know where to visit, depending on your area of interest and how to avoid the huge crowd, you can save your energy and time and also help destinations like Kyoto from a sustainable tourism point of view. And I've done a lot of solo traveling before, and I feel many solo travelers are introverted people. But in my opinion, it's always good to interact with locals. And if you don't speak Japanese, it may be overwhelming at the beginning. But if you know what to say and when to use these phrases and what to expect in people's responses, we can be much more comfortable starting conversations with locals. And I know local people would appreciate one on one communication as well. So it's beneficial for both ways. And one more thing, and one of the great advantages of the being an introvert is they are deep t h i n k e r And Japan has a rich culture, and almost everything you see and experience in Japan, if you ask deep questions, you'll find spiritual and philosophical meanings or historical and cultural contexts that are not obvious. Which would give introverted people a much more enlightening experience. Yeah, so introverted people have good eyes to notice things and can ask meaningful questions. 
But like anything, so you need to know the topic enough to ask good questions or think deeply. So what I like to offer is a pre-travel knowledge covering history, geography, cultural traditions, and anything related that would help people give a good context to what they experienced during their trip. You made so many great points there. Uh, I mean, I definitely agree that Japan is a great place to travel for introverts. I consider myself an introvert, and I love solo travel. Like a, cu- a couple of my trips to Japan have been by myself, and it was amazing. And I do think Japan's a great place for that. But I also, some of my favorite memories from those trips are times when I just happened to talk to a local in a restaurant or a bar and just had a conversation. And I mean, there was a bar in Okinawa where I ended up just sitting there for like four hours and, you know, people came in and out and I just had so many great conversations. You know, another thing I noticed you talk about on your website a bit is that idea of cultural immersion. And like you said, that is really difficult to get when you don't have a ton of in-depth knowledge about things. You know, Paul and I have talked about how on the podcast, we've learned so many things that would have been super useful for like places that we've already been to. Like we didn't really understand what we were seeing because we didn't have that background. So yeah, it sounds like, you know, what you're offering is awesome, would be great for a trip to Japan. One point you made that I really liked was the overcrowding of some places, just being able to be comfortable where you're at. The first time I went to Japan, I only spent a day in Kyoto. You know, and there's a million things to do in Kyoto. But I came back and I was like, eh, Kyoto was the least favorite part of my trip. And everyone was like, how is that possible? But it was just the way the day lined up. Like it took a while to get from Osaka to Kyoto. The train was delayed. Then I took this long, crowded bus ride with no air conditioning out to the Golden Pavilion, and it was really crowded there. And then we went to Kiyomizu Dera, and it was really crowded there, and I was just tired, and that's all we got to see all day. And then I went back to Kyoto with Jason, and we stayed there for a few nights and walked around the city and got to explore at our own pace, and I absolutely loved it. So it's really important how you go about planning these things for yourself. Yeah. So Miyuki, if somebody wanted to engage with this travel course, is the website the best place to do that? I guess we haven't mentioned your, the URL of your website either. <laughs> can you tell us about what's on your website? What can people find there? Yes. So my website is the best place to find all the details. Uh, my website is miyukiseguchi.com. So M-I-Y-U-K-I-S-E-G-U-C-H-I.com. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. If uh, listeners want to scroll down and check that out. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, but my website has also some other content uh, like a uh, blog and uh, podcast and Yes, yeah, some of the background information about myself as well. And I will be adding more information on my website. So if anyone interested in visiting Japan, yeah, please do check. Great. One thing that I think is really cool about your course, as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is rather than like booking a trip for somebody they're going to gain the knowledge and information that they need to successfully plan a trip themselves. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. So we've mentioned your podcast a couple of times, and I mentioned some of the types of things that you can find there. Can you tell us about kind of your plans for the future of the podcast, or what else should people know about your podcast? So my podcast, the Japan Express podcast, aims to help international travelers plan to prepare for their trip to Japan. But more specifically, I have people in mind, as I mentioned, um, who are interested in gaining authentic experiences and creating unique immersive experiences. And if I could uh, elaborate a little bit further about the immersive experiences, uh, what I mean by that is to interact uh, with local people as part of their travel experiences. So it could be a simple interaction uh, with local people you meet at accommodation, restaurants, or stations. Or it could be participating in cultural activity and learning skills from locals directly. 
or it could be、uh, spending a day with a local guide and having a local food surrounded by local people. So the level of immersion may be different, but it always involves、uh, some quality time with locals. And the reason why I highly recommend immersive travel experiences is that we tend to forget place names easily, but we remember people's kindness, friendliness, and all sorts of feelings we get、uh, through human interactions for a much longer period of time. And through these experiences, I believe you'll gain a much more meaningful experience than simply visiting places. And I feel these experiences themselves are what makes your trip truly unique. And yeah, so I would like to highlight、um, these experiences and create some good resources to serve the、uh, needs of the people who are interested in these experiences. Awesome. So you are a licensed guide. Could you elaborate on what that means and what you can offer as a licensed guide? Yes,、uh, sure. So basically, to become a licensed guide,、uh, you need to pass an extremely difficult exam. So we have to study diverse topics about Japan from history, geography, travel regulations and laws, and what's called general knowledge,、uh, which covers anything related to Japan. So I was providing、uh, tools before becoming a licensed guide, which is possible in Japan. But after I became a licensed guide, I realized that I could give so much more context and the stories as well as other support to the guest. And I found a new perspective of what I see and experience because of the cultural and the historical context that I came to understand on a much deeper level than before. Which has been an enlightening experience. So I feel that if the international travelers can have a knowledge like that, I think their experiences will be much more meaningful too. So, yes. So I'm super curious about this test. You, you mentioned the super difficult exam. <laughs> Is there any chance you could give us like an example of a question and we can see if Paul knows the answer to it? <laughs> Um, yes,、uh, for example, for the geography test, basically what you may be given will be、uh, a few different types of graphs showing the volume of rainfalls and the temperature level of different places. So, four different types of graphs, and what you have is、uh, the precipitation rate, the volume of rainfalls level. Throughout the year, and how the temperature fluctuates throughout the year. And you would need to match like, where these, each of the graphs shows to different parts of the world. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, you are not kidding. That sounds very difficult. I bet you could do it, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to study really hard. That's, that <laughs> sounds really、yourself. hard. <laughs>、uh, but, but if you know, like, Because there are some like regional characteristics for different parts of Japan. So if you know these things, you can easily match these choices.、Cool. Multiple choice always makes it a little bit easier. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So on your website, and well, I think you already mentioned maybe you have worked with local governments to help them with tourism stuff. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that work looks like? Yes, so I have worked with local governments, Nagano City and Miyazu City of the Kyoto by the Sea region. So many people may have heard of Nagano、um, because that's where the 1998、uh, Winter Olympic Games、uh, were held. It's been a popular destination for skiers and snowboarders. And it's also famous for historically and culturally significant Zenkoji Temple and Togakushi Shrine. And Miyazu City is where one of Japan's three major scenic views, Amano Hashidate, is situated. And Amano Hashidate is a naturally created sandbar with pine trees being planted on it. So it takes about two hours from Kyoto City and it's facing the Japan Sea. So you'd get a different scenery there. 
So my role was basically helping the local government by providing views from the outsiders in order to help boost the economy in the local areas from the tourist point of view. So Japan is an aging society, and that's happening in these local areas. So they are becoming more open to welcoming people from other communities and making connections with visitors, travelers, and all other people who are interested in these local areas. So as I learned more about these local challenges,、um, I become more keen to help support these local areas by sharing the terms of these areas and encouraging more people to visit these lesser known areas. Cool. Actually, I just saw a picture of Amano Hashidate on Instagram today. That looks like a beautiful place. And another place I wanted to visit nearby there is Ine. Have you been to Ine?、Yes. Oh, that place looks so cool. You know that one, Paul? No, I don't. They got these like little boat houses right on the water. Just the pictures of that area are just insane. Anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been researching a lot of places in Japan. You know, even though we already kind of know where we're going on our trip, I just got so excited. I started looking at everything else, and I can't believe how many great places there are in Chubu. There actually seem to be more like good places to go to in Chubu than any other region, maybe in Japan. Wow, that's a that's a big claim, Paul. I know, and I was <laughs> surprised, but that that was the conclusion of my research. All right, Paul's opinion only. It's really good to hear that because yes, I'm currently based in the central region or Chubu. So, one other question I had for you is: you mentioned that you spend a lot of time living overseas. Has that impacted the way that you view Japan now? Yes, this is a really great question, and I feel overall and over time, Japan to me hasn't changed much. What has changed, however, is how I understand Japan and the rest of the world, and the level of my understanding about Japan and the world. So, after visiting many different countries and communicating with people from all over the world, what I've realized was that what we think is normal isn't a normal thing to other people. So, what I've learned、uh, was the need to get to know more about my country. Um, because of when never speaking to people who don't know anything about Japan or haven't been to Japan, you need to explain any topics in details or provide cultural and historical context to what you are talking about. So it means we need to know things enough to be able to explain things. And at the same time, I got to know more about different cultures, and through the process, I've discovered、uh, some unique characteristics of Japan. Such as safety, cleanliness, punctuality, and variety, and I feel these are the real value of Japan, and they are reflected in people's characteristics as well as what we experience being in Japan. That's great. I'm personally a big fan of punctuality. <laughs> yeah, that's just me, but I, I appreciate that. I'm curious. So you said that once you. Started to see other countries. You started to realize ways that Japan is different from other places. Can you talk about what are some of the the biggest things that maybe surprised you, like things that are normal in Japan that aren't normal elsewhere? Yes, yes, that's a great question, and there are a the few examples. But I would like to talk about the example of Shinkansen, the bread train service,、oh, yeah. uh, which I. Which still surprises me、uh, even nowadays.、Um, I don't know if you know about this story. The Shinkansen is a nationwide network with nine different lines across Japan, and among them, the Tokaido Shinkansen that connects between Tokyo and Osaka has the highest frequency. And every three to four minutes, the Tokaido Shinkansen leaves Tokyo Station. And you only have twelve minutes between when the Shinkansen arrives at the station and when it's departing again. So it usually takes about five minutes for passengers to get off and get on the Shinkansen. So it means you have only seven minutes to clean inside the carriage. So Shinkansen usually has sixteen carriages, and a couple of dozen people will do the cleaning. 
And as far as I'm able to research, the cleaning had never affected the delays of the Shinkansen. So meaning that the cleaning is always completed on time. And what I really like and feel very much about Japan is that these cleaning people line up on a platform when the cleaning is done and they both do the passengers. So <laughs> I really like this story. And maybe this is a great example of how the Japan is so unique from the rest of the world. Yeah, I love that. I remember seeing a video, I think it was a、uh... Probably begin Japanology. Are you familiar with that show? Yes.、Um, I think they did an episode about the Shinkansen and they showed those, those workers doing that. And it's just, it's incredible. I mean, the entire Shinkansen system, the way that everything, all these moving parts just work so perfectly together, it's incredible. And that's one thing that I am super jealous of. Because <laughs> here, <laughs> I mean, obviously, America is huge, but you know, the lack of decent public transportation. Is really sad. And I just went on a rant recently, I think, about how、uh, all the automobile companies and the lobbyists, they're the reason that we don't have a decent train system in America. But that's another you, conversation. Yeah, you're not, you're not wrong, but let's not go down that road. I liked you mentioned that after they're done cleaning, they, they bow to all the passengers. When I first went to Japan, I was so blown away and impressed with the customer service. For my whole career, I've done sales, retail, customer service type jobs. So I was actually inspired. I was like, every place I went, I got welcomed when I came in, I got thanked for my purchase. Everybody was like so eager to help me, and they all seemed to care so much. That I, I was just like, wow, I want to try to emulate this myself. It kind of like set the bar higher for my own personal ambitions. Totally.、Um, so, should we talk a little bit about some travel tip type stuff? I'm curious、yeah. what you would, as a Japanese person, what would you say are the must sees? Like, if someone is going to Japan for the very first time, And they want to get a sense of the culture in as short a time as possible. What are the things that they absolutely need to see? Yes.、Um, so, what I recommend is to visit at least、uh, three different regions to experience regional characteristics. As you know, Japan has eight different regions covering subarctic in the north to subtropical in the south. Plus, Japan has four distinct seasons, so it gives you a great variety、uh, depending on where to visit and when to visit. And this regionality and variety is what I'd love people to experience、uh, when they are in Japan. And to do that, I'd love people to take day trips to the countryside and rural areas within different regions, because that's how and where you usually find regional characteristics. And I personally、uh, recommend visiting、uh, Kanto, Chubu, and Kansai to start with. Just to give a reference to listeners, Kanto is where Tokyo is located, while Kansai is in the western Japan. And what's between Kanto and Kansai is the Chubu region, which literally means the central part in Japanese. So I feel that Kansai is a great destination for history lovers like me. So, Nara and Kyoto are where Japan's capital was located before it moved to Tokyo in the 19th century, meaning they are where emperors used to live. So, there are many historical sites and temples that have a history for more than 1,000 years. In the Kanto region,、uh, we have a great metropolitan area around Tokyo. The history is short, too, but it was the center of modernization. Which began about 150 years ago. So we can notice the Western influences and foreign cultures in cities like Tokyo and Yokohama. So these, are, of course, became the foundation of how the international city like Tokyo was built. So some people may wonder how knowing about Japanese history would help them. But it's not only about history, but also the culture, geography, and other subject fields. 
if you get to understand how it's connected to what you are experiencing, like landscapes, local food, and cultural activities, you realize the real value of this. And for example, some of the things I've heard in the past from the tourists are that I get bored with visiting temples and shrines. But I feel if you know the context and the stories behind each different place, their experiences、uh, would have been so much different. And if I could. If I could share a little bit about the Chubu region as well. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I feel like most people, especially like on the first trip to Japan, most people probably start in Tokyo. They take the Shinkansen down to Kyoto and Osaka, and then they come back. So I was curious, yeah, what is the best way to get a taste of the Chubu region instead of just skipping straight past it, you know? Yes, so the Chubu has the biggest number of prefectures among the eight、um, regions of Japan. And the area facing the Japan Sea, the Pacific coastal area, and the inland areas are all different from each other. But、uh, generally speaking,、um, they have a great nature, countryside landscapes, and the samurai history and the castles. And the central region has one of the Japan's biggest manufacturing centers. And it's known as a major producing area s for traditional crafts such as pottery and lacquerware, as well as for fermented food, including miso, mirin, and vinegar, which are the secret ingredients that m a k e Japanese cuisine so delicious. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, that's part of what's so cool about Chubu is that there's so much there. You got the <laughs> Sea of Japan coast, you have the Pacific coast, and then you have the mountain region in the middle. With all the small towns and things. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot there. Definitely. Is there <laughs>、yes. one or two specific places you would recommend <laughs> that you don't think people would otherwise hear about? Okay.、Um, you can stop me anytime if I speak too, <laughs> too much. Okay. <Sure. laughs> so, okay. So, I'd like to introduce a castle that I personally visited and thought it was visiting. There are 12 castles in Japan, with their castle keep being intact for more than 400 years. And five of them are registered as a national treasure castle. I've been to four of them, as well as many others, including reconstructed ones. And many people who are interested in castles may first think about visiting Himeji. I've been there、uh, it looks stunning, and it's one of the largest castles that exist in Japan. But I'd like to recommend Hikone Castle, which is located in the center of Japan, right next to Japan's largest lake, Lake Biwa. The reason I highly recommend Hikone、uh, is that they have not only a castle that has kept for more than 400 years, But also a daimyo garden, which was used by the feudal lord that ruled the region, as well as a palace museum that exhibits a great collection of arts and crafts, armors and Japanese swords, and other items that are used and handed down through the multiple generations of E family who ruled the Hikone from the entire time of the 260 years of the Edo period. So, just to give our listeners an idea, E Clan was the number two of the Edo government after the Tokugawa family. So, it was a wealthy domain among more than 200 feudal lands, which was a part of the reason that it still has a great collection. And because they have not only the castle, but also the palace museum and the garden, as well as other related sites, I think it's a great place to get to know how the life for samurai really were, who they were, and what kind of social and hierarchy system there was in that area. And because there are sites that help people understand the significance of these details, this is exactly the reason why the Hikone Castle has been selected as one of Japan's next candidates to be listed on the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage Site. Nice. And not to mention, the castle was strategically built to be used for battles, which didn't happen in the end. But the battle they were in mind was the one against Toyotomi, which was in Osaka. So that's why the castle is 
a rectangular shape, and the front is facing Osaka. And despite the size of this castle, it has a lots of decorative roofs、um, that help the castle look splendid. Wow. And yes, and it was also located in a strategically important location. So it's right next to Lake Viva, meaning that you can get a boat and travel to Kyoto when requested. And Kyoto was where emperors and aristocrats、uh, lived, and the E family was the number two in the Edo government, meaning that、um, they had to be culturally sophisticated to speak to these people in the higher class. So at that time, One of the highly sophisticated cultural activities was the tea ceremony, and that's why there are four tea houses in the garden attached to the castle. And some of them are allowed to enter, and you can have a matcha tea inside. And there is a no theater inside the Paris Museum that shows the living spaces and the office area of the feudal lords. And they have a no masks and other corrections used for the theatrical performers, and that's because no was also a way to entertain other feudal lords and make deeper bonds between them. So I feel that knowing these cultural and historical backgrounds really helped me to appreciate the castles on a deeper level. Definitely, <laughs> you know, I I went to Kanazawa and started. That was like my first time seeing kind of a samurai quarter kind of area. And I think that was even right after we did episodes about like samurai and and swords, and it was so cool, you know, having a little bit of that background knowledge and going into that, and you know, learning about the different classes of samurai and stuff. Ah, I love that! Like, I want to go to Hikone Castle so bad now. <laughs> Me too. It's on the list now. You're great at selling these places. <laughs> Yes, because I only recommend the one I feel it's really worth visiting. Because I know like how long the international travelers needs to travel, so they need to take a long flight. So I only recommend the sites、um, that are worth visiting, even if you need to take a long flight. So <laughs> definitely. Speaking of like making the most of a trip, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, they might only get to Japan like once in their lifetime. So you want to, you know, you want to make sure that you plan your trip the best way you possibly can. Are there any things that you see people do that you wouldn't recommend? Like, are there mistakes that people tend to make when they're planning a trip to Japan? Yeah, sure. So I would think、um, I feel like I being keep repeating myself, but but I would think many people are researching destinations and places to visit. But what many people may underestimate is the importance of learning about history, geography, culture, and the language of the country they are visiting. So, because that's what makes all the difference, and with a really good knowledge, you'll be able to find a new perspective and appreciate things on a much deeper level. So, you can ask deeper questions and make your experiences a much more meaningful one. And of course, I feel like with this knowledge, you can find the right choice for your trip and plan your trip better. So I really hope that、uh, people will realize the true value of the knowledge you can build about Japan. And I'd love to help、uh, people who are interested in learning more about Japan. I agree a hundred percent that having that background knowledge is essential. Yeah, I agree, and I think it's really important to. Learn just a little bit of the language if you can, because even if you know a couple sentences, people are so much easier to open up to you if you're trying. If you show that you're trying, everybody perks up and everybody wants to get to know you a little better. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So Miyuki, as a local in Japan, we wanted to ask you about a couple possible misconceptions that people outside of Japan have. About Japan, so the one that interests me a lot is I think a lot of people have the notion that Japan's a really high tech society and everything in Japan is futuristic and high tech and wired. Do you think that is a is a correct idea people have about Japan? Um, ah,、uh, it's a it's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> 
I feel that the、mm, because some people in a really local area, like some some foreign people, actually laugh about this, but. Some Japanese people in a really local areas or big old companies, they still use a fax machine. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the you know, big things I've heard about when people are kind of poking at this misconception. It's like, well, fax machines are everywhere. So obviously, Japan can't be incredibly high tech. But at the same time, I mean, there, there are a lot of high tech things in Japan, right? I think Paul and I talked not too long ago about how. Toyota, was it, is like creating a new city to test all of their new tech and robots and stuff, self driving cars and all that. So I guess both of those things can exist at the same time, right? Yes, yes. And I recently visited,、uh, I don't know if it will be classified as a high tech example, but I recently visited a sushi restaurant. And you know, usually at the Kaiten Zushi, the sushi will be on the conveyor belt. So it will be, you can take the sushi plate as you like, right? And these, these type of restaurants exist overseas nowadays. But the sushi restaurant I visited recently, basically, you don't have to speak to anyone because as once you get in, you just like have to operate the machine. And you just have to type like how many people you are.、Um, so you just like type that, and there will be the small slip saying the number of the, your table. And you basically have to go and sit at the table. And you use the like iPad size thing, and you just like type what you want to order and everything. And the sushi will be served in a Shinkansen look like, like train look like <laughs> <laughs> things. And all the plates, not only sushi, but other t y p e of food will be served on this machine. And, and basically, um, yeah, you, because、uh, this like iPad sync machine will calculate how many things you've ordered, right? So, All you have to do is go to the check in counter and just, yeah, just scan the QR code and pay the bill. And I don't know if this is an example of the high tech Japan, but definitely、um, Japan is moving towards this kind of automated system. And this is exactly the reason why、um, Japan is,、uh, like some people say, The、Japan is very cheap, right, compared to other countries. I think the one of the reasons why is that Japan is very successful in cutting costs by introducing these machine, like automation systems and making everything、um, automated. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that example definitely counts as high tech. And I think maybe that's what gives people that idea that Japan is so high tech because it's like a lot of kind of Public facing, customer facing stuff is automated, which we don't see as much here. So I don't know, maybe we're almost proving that this misconception is actually, in a way, <laughs> true. Like Japan does have a lot of high tech stuff, and that, you know, the conveyor belt sushi, I mean, that's been famous. People have been talking about that for a decade at least. We actually just got at the Mall of America near us, we just got a Kaiten Zushi place, Kura Sushi, which I think is a Japanese chain, right? Yes, yes,、yeah. it is. We got the first one and it was super popular. I mean, I went there like a few weeks after they opened. And yeah, it was just after opening, but there was a big line because all of that was just so new and so exciting to see like robots delivering your drinks and the, <laughs> the conveyor belt. And, and like you said, the iPad outside for like the, you know, putting your name in and stuff. It's all just so cool and novel and exciting. Yes,、um, if I could、uh, do one more thing. Yeah.、Um, so, the, the reason why I thought it's so impressive is that the sushi that you like will be served. Because in Japan, people don't really like the conveyor belt style sushi so much because the sushi are not fresh, right?、Mm. So, what we usually do is order the sushi we like. 
and they will make the sushi for me, right? Specifically. So you don't have to take the sushi which were on the conveyor belt, but this will be the waste of food, right? But this restaurant, the system is if you choose a sushi you like, this sushi will be made specifically for you. So there won't be any waste. Um, that's why I thought it's a more reasonable way and much better way to serve people. Yeah. The sushi. Yeah, that's really smart. Yeah, I love the Japanese idea of like mo tainai, right? Don't、yeah. waste, don't be wasteful. I love that. So, speaking of sushi, you know, I think a lot of people have this impression maybe that sushi is like a super common food that people like eat every day in Japan. Like that's just kind of a standard meal. Is that a misconception? Um, well, so I like sushi and seafood generally. So I eat sushi quite a lot, but maybe once a month or sometimes more, but not, definitely not every day. Because it's, sushi is not a homemade dish.、Um, sushi is something we eat at a restaurant or we buy at a shop. So. There are much more popular food than sushi in Japan, such as like teishoku or donburi mono or noodles, such as udon and soba. These are the t y p e of the foods that are more popular, and probably that's more the common choice for the Japanese people for lunch, for example.、Hmm. Now I'm, I'm curious, this just popped into my head. Does the average Japanese person Ever make sushi at home? Is that a thing? So, when I was、uh, living abroad, the one of the questions I got asked all the time was, Can you make sushi? And the answer is no, because we don't make sushi at home. Because there are the fresh sushi just like everywhere, right? So, we don't have to make sushi at home, but we, instead, we,、uh, we can. Buy sushi at a restaurant or even at the convenience store, or most people usually go out、um, to eat sushi at the restaurant. And the sushi chef,、um, they will make a sushi for you. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like a lot of people here actually try making sushi themselves, maybe mostly out of an effort to cut costs because sushi here is pretty expensive generally. Or, I mean, you know. Maybe just an interest in the culture and like it's fun. It's a fun kind of project to try to put together sushi. Yeah, I make sushi sometimes. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's an American thing to make sushi at home. <laughs> yeah.、Um, can we talk about chopsticks etiquette for a second? Because I feel like I've seen articles of like, here's the 10 things you should never do with your chopsticks. <laughs> and they talk about like, Don't stick them straight up in your rice or don't put them like in an X over your bowl or something or don't like hover your chopsticks over the next piece of food while you're still chewing on the last piece of food. But then I've also heard from people like all of that is not something you really need to worry about. And maybe it's, you know, as a foreigner, nobody's going to expect you to have proper chopsticks etiquette or even. In Japan, like, do people really pay close attention to that kind of thing? Or is that the kind of thing that your grandma scolds you about and nobody really cares that much? Yeah, that's a great question.、Um, I personally feel that these articles are over exaggerating things because I think, like, honestly, like, in recent years, I have seen like, many people from outside Asian countries are using chopsticks very well. And it's really like you don't have to worry about too much, even if you don't know how to use it properly. But I feel that the, you are not used to using the chopsticks, right? So, they, sure, there are manners. But you wouldn't do something that、uh, written in these articles because you basically don't know how to use it, right? So you wouldn't, for example, like the, one of the things that's often said is that you can just put the chopsticks on a bowl of rice in the straight into the rice. 
um, because that considered th th these are some of the things that are done for the deceased people. But you don't do that because <laughs> that because in the daily life, um, you wouldn't think about doing these things, right? Um, there is a money, and as we grew up, we are taught to use uh, chopsticks in a proper manner. But I think as a international traveler is based in Japan, I really think um, people don't need to think about too much about these manners. Yeah, I feel that, that there are much more important things that people should be more paying close attention um, that are related to the things that would bother other people. So as I mentioned, Japanese people care so much about the safety, punctuality, and cleanliness. And any of the things that would be related to these things, I think people should be more paying um, closer attention to these things because that may bother some of the Japanese people, more likely. Yeah. So I'm just curious, you, you talked about like growing up in Japan, people are taught certain chopsticks manners. Can you just tell us a little bit like what types of rules are kind of stressed for kids growing up in Japan? Um, for example, if you are holding chopsticks, Basically, you normally you don't do this, right? But <laughs> basically, you can't point at somebody with chopsticks, right? So the chopsticks is for eating. So you can't do anything, any other activities <laughs> using chopsticks, right? Mm -hmm. But it's impossible to do these things. Or usually, um, you may notice at some of the places or when maybe when you are having a dinner or maybe you are having uh, food together with the Japanese people. Usually, uh, we share food, right? Like at the izakaya restaurant. And usually what happens is that we have a food, these are separate chopsticks that are for nobody, that are for specifically for people to use to allocate food for each different person. So... We don't share chopsticks uh, with people because it's for courtesy to others. And yeah, what else? I don't think about these things so much. So <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of these things on top of my head. But um, yeah, basically, yeah, it, it might not be strictly like related to chopsticks rules. But for example, when we have a uh, rice, the bowl of rice, right? We usually have to take the rice bowl, and then we usually, um, Japanese people are right-handed, so have a chopsticks with the right hand and uh, a bowl of rice on the left hand. And yeah, that's a proper manner. You cannot put the rice bowl on the table and eat it. It's, it's a oh. bad manner. Interesting. Oh. I did not know that. I have one more chopsticks question. So when Paul and I are in Japan and we're eating sushi and I notice a little piece of rice stuck onto Paul's cheek, is it appropriate for me to reach over with my chopsticks and grab that piece of rice and take it off of his face? Um, I'm making a dumb joke. That's, uh, just, that's just me being I, stupid. I don't think the chopsticks is the problem in that scenario. <laughs> I, should just, I should just lean over and, and lick the rice off of your cheek, right? Um, maybe you could just let me know. <laughs> well, that's like the least fun way to handle that, but okay. I mean, really? We... Is that near the story? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's only happened a couple times. <laughs> uh, we would definitely get some attention, I think, if that happened. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, we talked earlier about how it's really nice to learn a just a little bit of Japanese, at least, to be able to try to communicate with the locals. But if you know no Japanese at all, are you going to have a hard time getting around? Are you able to come to Japan with basically no knowledge of Japanese? Um, so maybe I'd like to introduce my personal experiences uh, related to the times that I was living in the UK. And I feel that the being able to communicate um, through language is important. But I feel um, there is uh, also the other ways um, you can experience 
the local culture and getting to know the local people, even if like, you don't speak any Japanese. Because when I, was, when I first moved to the UK, so my English level was elementary. So I only knew、um, only a few English words and I was barely able to make sentences. And I couldn't catch、uh, what people were saying. So I didn't know what's the proper way to say or behave in different situations, like ordering food or getting on a public transport. But I used my five senses to perceive、um, what people were saying. Or I tried my best to communicate with people, although I barely understood what they were saying at the beginning. But I try to behave in a way that people are more open to speaking to me, like trying to make eye contact and giving a smile on my face when saying the thank you. And I think, like, even through this interaction, we can get to learn a lot about each other. And that's the beginning of the immersive travel experiences. So that's how I would love international travelers to try when they are in Japan. I say this because I know Japanese people are generally very friendly and nice, and it's a safe environment. So I think people can benefit from these experiences a lot. So, to follow up on that, so I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very normal to learn English in Japanese school. So, everyone almost has taken some English class, but I feel like I've seen. Kind of a running joke from Japanese people that most people aren't very confident with their English. So if there's a foreigner walking by, there may be a little bit, oh, I, ho- I hope they don't say something in English to me. That's like a common joke in anime, right? You see that come up in anime where people are like making fun of their friend for not wanting to go talk to the foreigner or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I mean, in my experience, people have been very helpful. And most of them definitely know more English than I do Japanese, I would have to say. Yeah,、um, so you are very right. So basically,、um, Japanese people、um, study English at school, but、uh, Japan's English、um, education is focused on reading and listening. So, not so much on speaking and writing. So, you may find many people, many Japanese people, being not so eager to speak in English. And you, you, you may be surprised.、Um, you know, as you know, like Japan is a mono ethnic country, so with 98% of the population being a Japanese. What may be even more surprising is that only one in four Japanese people h a s a passport, meaning that many Japanese are not accustomed to foreign languages and customs and the people from abroad. So I think that's why. You may get this sort of impression from being yeah, closer to the Japanese people. That's funny that you bring that up. I just read an article today that talked about that statistic that so few Japanese people have a passport. It also talked about how since the pandemic, something like 34%, I want to say, of Japanese people said that they were not interested in traveling anymore. Yeah, so the rate of the passport holidays is on a decline, actually. So,、hmm. where do you like to take vacations in Japan? Yeah, are、wow. there places that you like to go that maybe people from outside of the country have never heard of? Or maybe more in general, are there places that more people from Japan go to versus international and places where more international people go than local people? Yes, this is a really great question, but it's a difficult one for me. So, there are many places,、um, but maybe I can give you an example about Kyoto. So, as、uh, Paul mentioned earlier, I was feeling the same thing.、Um, for a very long time, I didn't like Kyoto so much. I always had the impression that Kyoto is a very busy everywhere I go, like the Arashiyama Bamboo Forest or the Hushimi Nari, the Kiyomizu Dera, they are so busy. And as an introverted traveler, I tend to avoid these busy places because I get tired before actually getting to appreciate things. But once I started to、um, look to visit lesser known places like temples and gardens attached to them, 
I got to notice the beauty more and started to like Kyoto a lot. And now I feel that every time I go back to Kyoto, there are always new discoveries. And I feel local experts、um, visit the same city, but they visit different places and appreciate things on different levels. And because they know where to visit for their interest and how to appreciate things better, I feel these things could happen. So that people basically visit the same city, but visit the different places and appreciate things on a deeper level、uh, or a different level. And I, I feel it's totally possible for international travelers to do the same with the right resources. And that's the exact reason why I wanted to create and offer such resources for international travelers. Yeah,、um, that sounds great. Did I? So, yeah, sorry, I, I, didn't, I couldn't really yeah, think about the off the beaten past locations because, you know, I, I strongly believe that even if like, I tell the names of these off the beaten past locations or lesser known places, Unless you see the value, the real value of the places, they won't be interested in visiting, right? Because there are like such a strong push or the bigger promotion going on on the major tourist attractions. And even if I suggest these lesser known places, unless you gain the knowledge about the Overall picture of Japan, you wouldn't notice these things, or unless you know like what to expect in high seasons and what to expect in low seasons, you wouldn't really realize the value of visiting in a lower seasons or visiting in lesser known places. Because, like, I feel the same if I visit the overseas, I visit a new country, like, I would first would like to check out. The major tourist attractions because these sites are more like familiar to me. And I, I think it's a totally natural thing to do. But so that's why I really want to, like, like I said before, I like to recommend places that are really worth visiting. So that's why, like, yes,、yeah, sorry, I, I can't. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point. <laughs> Having a list of Names of places that would be cool to visit isn't really useful at all until you have that background knowledge, like you're saying. And I feel like on our podcast, sometimes I've thought about that when we're doing episodes about like a, a whole region, you know, and we're going kind of city by city or prefecture by prefecture talking about all these sites. And it's like each thing we spend, you know, 30 seconds talking about because there's so much. Yeah. Another example of that is. Last time we were talking, Miyuki, I asked you about Nagoya because I was considering going there, but I was looking for, I suppose I was looking for like one attraction that I couldn't miss for a reason to go there. But you kind of explained to me about the history of the region and all these little day trips you could go see. And I was like, I'm thinking about this wrong. Instead of the one place, I should have been thinking about the idea of history. Like, history is the reason to go there. And I can see all these different things that tie together and go with what I know about the history of Japan and learn more. And now I'm really excited to go to that region when I get a chance. So you helped、yes. frame that for me a little bit. So、oh. thank you. You just made me realize something, Paul. It's almost like you don't want to come at something from like, oh, I want to go see this place. Let me learn about like the history of that place or something. It's more like, let me learn about. The overall history, and then let me zero in on the things that, like, especially interest me about that, and let that kind of guide you to a certain place to visit. Yes,、um, I don't know if you want to use this part, and、uh, you don't have to, totally okay. And I always think、um, the, and I talked about in that way too, but Kyoto has a long history, but Nara has a much older history. And it's actually the place that the, all the history, like after the sixth century, like all the history started in Nara. And if you visit there, you'll get to see, for example, like temples in Nara. They are like different from temples in other areas. And without、um, seeing that, you wouldn't really get to know the real value of temples in Japan. And that's fine. 
I really appreciate your podcast and the information you put together. So that's why I was so impressed about the, how you collected all these resources, just being on the internet, right? Um, or yeah. visiting just a few times to Japan, because it's really difficult to like put together all these great source of information、uh, without really being able to recognize the real value. And yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank that, you. That means a lot to hear. Yeah, and also, like, you like, focused on the regions, right? Like, all the different regions. I really like, like the approach because, yeah, that's the, basically the things I also would like to highlight, like, regional characteristics as a great. And that's the things like, more people should pay more close attention to. So, I really. Love the approach. And yeah, I've listened to a lot of episodes. <laughs> I still, <laughs>、so、I still have a lot to catch up on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we got, have a lot we, out there. We got a few episodes. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're done with the regions and some of the major cities. I'm starting to think, like, do we start doing prefectures? I think we have to. That would, that would、yeah. give us quite a few more episodes to, to get through. Yeah. Yes, but, but if I could add, like, even within the prefectures, they are not like, divided by regional characteristics. So, for example,、right. for Gifu, the northern part of Gifu and the southern part of Gifu are very different,、uh, like, geographically and culturally different. If the like, geography is different, like, the people's characteristics or the cultures of food will be different. So, yeah, it's a totally. Unique country, and it's, yeah, it's really <laughs> difficult to see the big picture, even for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it took me a long time. I mean, when we started doing the podcast, you know, little by little, I started to realize, yeah, you know, I think a lot of Americans have this idea of Japan in their head. It's like, oh, Mount Fuji and Sakura and sushi. And I didn't realize. Until we started getting into this research and stuff, just how much there really are these specific local cultures all over Japan. And, like you said, like the prefectures are just kind of political divisions, not necessarily cultural divisions. You know, my sister actually just sent me this thing today on Instagram about Michi no Eki.、Mm-hmm. Like these little, can you explain what a Michi no Eki is? Is what that's about. So, so it's basically the place for drivers to stop at. So, Michi no Eki are all over Japan. And it's a place where you can eat or where you can get some like local unique things while you are taking a trip or while you are going to somewhere. And some local people, for example, some vegetables or like locally produced food. These products、uh, will be delivered to Michi no Eki so local people can sell these items at these prices. Yeah, it, it, it's not on the highway, it's just on a local road. And there are a lot of them across Japan. Yeah, I just think that's such a cool idea. I think I saw actually an episode of Begin Japanology about that too. They talked about like, these regional cultures and how these Michi no Eki kind of let people get a little taste of that. Even as they're just kind of driving through. And、uh, I don't know, I, that's just something I think is so cool about Japan that that exists and that that's such an important part of the culture that people really try to kind of advertise and like educate people about the local culture. Because, like in America, I feel like we don't really have that as much. I mean, America is so huge. And of course, there are different cultures and different accents in different parts of the country. But everything is so spread out. You know, there are a few little things that specific places are known for, but I feel like it's not as pronounced, maybe. I get the impression that maybe people in the UK would、mm. kind of understand more about what that's like, because I keep hearing about in the UK, I mean, obviously it's more compact, but also like, it's like you drive 20 miles and the accent changes, and like they have this identity, this internal idea of like who. They are as members of that community, you know? Yes, yeah. If I could add one thing to your comment. So, I sometimes travel to Kyoto and I take a tr- local train. And what happens is that Maibara,、uh, which is a Shinkansen station、um, that's closest to the Hikone Castle, that is the、uh, 
middle point between JR Tokai and JR like Central and JR Kansai. And you know, like you see the different colors of trains and you see people's accent change and you see the travel kind of like adverts in the train changes. So like I really like、um, these kind of local experiences, like how the I don't know if it's only me, like because I am a Japanese person, I just want to see like how the international travelers would notice these, these things as well, like regional differences. Yeah, it, it's really, yeah. I would love to know if, if the international travelers can also, if they are like really paying attention to these things, if they can catch these, these signals. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, I think. Foreign travelers probably are much less in tune with differences in accent. You know, if you don't speak the language, it's hard to pick up on that kind of thing. One thing that I really love that I appreciate from my trips is,、uh, you know, taking the Shinkansen to different places. I always try to get an ekiben and try like some local foods. I think that's awesome.、Uh, even on the plane, actually, I flew out of Okinawa. And I got a bento that was all like Okinawan specialties just for one last taste of that before I went to another part of Japan. But that stuff is so cool to me. Yeah, I think the food is a really easy way to tell the difference between regions. That's something that everybody will notice and understand. Yeah. And I,、uh, even the same food, like, you know, the topping and the, the color of the soup and the taste, they are different. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, I do think, Jason, you're, you're underselling the diversity of America a little bit. <laughs> I was worried. I didn't want to like offend. Any, you know, Wisconsin's got their cheese、uh, they, and they got their beer. They do. And they got their special variety of old fashioned, I guess.、Right. But Wisconsin itself is enormous. And you have to drive pretty far from Minnesota to get into Wisconsin and experience that type of culture. I guess that's what I meant is just that things are kind of more spread out. Is that fair? <laughs> yes, that's fair. Like, America is really big. Our population density is definitely much less than Japan. But depending where you go, like, you know, we're in the cities here. If you drive not too far out of the cities, you start getting a rural accent. Well, there's city culture and rural culture. Those are, anyway. Anyway. This isn't a podcast about. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Miyuki, it's been amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been really informative, and I'm, I'm sure our listeners will get a lot out of that. And I, it sounds like your Japan travel course would be extremely helpful, and I would recommend it to our listeners. Yeah, it was a great conversation. So thank you so much, Miyuki. So, where can people find you online if they're looking to find more information about your course or yourself? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was wonderful to speak to you. So, As I mentioned, my website is miyukiseguchi.com. That's M I Y U K I S E G U C H I.com. And that's where the people can find all the information about what I do and some of the useful information about Japan and planning a trip to Japan. And I also host the Facebook group, the Japan Expats Community. So if anyone has any questions about Japan or planning a trip to Japan, please do. Feel free to join the group. And I also host the Japan Experts podcast, and my Instagram is at japan.experts. Thank you so much. And thank you. And、uh, I'm going to put all of that contact information and links in the show notes for any listeners that are looking for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's been fun. Well, that was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Yeah, me as well. That was a ton of fun. It's great to get a perspective from a Japanese person on the podcast. Definitely. We haven't done a ton of interviews. So it's a nice change of pace for us, I think. Yeah. Great to get a local perspective. Definitely. Yeah. I am curious、uh, what our listeners think. Are interviews fun? Do you like getting the third perspective? Should we、uh, try to line some more of these up? Or do you just want to hear a couple doofuses ramble on about all sorts of random things? <laughs> Let us know. If you want to send us an email, you can send it to feedback at sightseeingjapanpodcast.com or you can reach out on Instagram where we are at SJP Podcast or you can go to our 
website, sightseeingjapanpodcast.com, and there's a contact form on there as well. Yeah, we've actually gotten quite a few good recommendations for topics over the years from our listeners. We still have a long list of suggestions to get through, but we're always welcoming new suggestions. Absolutely. So this is the last episode of season two of the podcast, but there's a lot to look forward to coming up soon. I can't wait. We mentioned a ton of stuff in the intro, but one thing that came up during the episode was Nara. And Nara is definitely going to be one of our topics in season three. Yeah. Yeah. And like Miyuki was saying, there's so much history there. And I remember when you and I first went to Nara like seven years ago, and we walked out of the train station and this guy started talking to us and like mentioned that Nara was like the ancient capital of Japan. And I don't think either of us knew that at the time, (laughs) but yeah, it's a fascinating place. Yeah, Nara is another one of those places where I want to go back because we didn't spend a ton of time there and I wasn't fully aware of the history and the story of Nara. Mm-hmm. So definitely need to make it back someday and dive a little deeper into all that stuff. Yeah, a but, lot of people have heard of Nara just because of those friendly deer. And don't get me wrong, they're the, awesome. The bowing deer are pretty cool. But there's so much more to Nara. Yeah, I mean, it just blows my mind that you think of Kyoto as the ancient capital. Nara was the capital before Kyoto. Like yeah. That's some history right there. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us for season two. We hope you enjoyed the last 10 episodes. And we are very much looking forward to doing more episodes. Yeah. More episodes. We got our trip to Japan coming up. I'm just excited about everything right now. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for listening. And we'll see you up ahead in season three.